Hallelujah. I am so excited. I believe the Lord's got a word for us this evening. And so let's, um, let's just pray. Father, thank you for your word that you're going to bring forth. Help me to share what's on your heart for, for your people here and for those watching online. B'Shem Yeshua. Amen. This teaching is called A Woman of Fire. Aishit Lapidot. Here's what's happening, family. God is preparing women to have a voice in this season that is amplified. He's preparing women to be mothers of nations. Mothers of nations. Birthing children physically and spiritually. And these women are going to be known as women that are flames of fire. I'm, all right, I'm done. Y'all can't even. <laughs> Some of y'all women are already on fire. I don't need a response, but I thought that would be pretty exciting. All right. And what Ken said when he was up here is going to dovetail perfectly because you know what? If you're married, you can get on board and be united with your wife and move forward and do amazing things. Or you can be married and you can be like Balak or uh, Barach who went to Deborah and said, I can't do it, you do it. So there's a bunch of lazy men that are going to be surpassed by these flamey women if you don't get it together. Because God will take your wife and continue to do things with her. She won't reach her maximum potential without you there, but he'll still do stuff with her. But I'm expecting, I'm expecting in this house that families will be one. God is in the process of, hallelujah, God is in the process of making marriages and taking them to a whole new level of oneness. And single women, you just stay connected to Yahweh Elohim, your husband. He's already ahead of you. If you can just stay in his shadow, you will catch on fire and do whatever he says. You'll accomplish great things in the kingdom. Torah portion. Chaya Serah. And Sarah lived to be 127 years old. Whoa. And she was looking good. She was. You ever seen one of those older ladies and you're like, oh my goodness, you're beautiful. And those women are believers because you can see an older pretty lady, she's got demon lust. But you see, you see an older lady that's beautiful, but it's coming from the inside, but her also, her outside, you can catch that and you'll be like, oh, wow, that's a holy, beautiful woman right there. And this is Sarah. She was that woman. Hallelujah. So I've color-coded this. This says, Chaya Sarah. Sarah lived, Meya Shana, a hundred years, Ve'esrim Shana, and 20 years, Ve'sheva Shanim, and seven years. Okay? And the Torah portion comes from this right here. Chaya Sarah. So we're going we're gonna to look at this for a minute. I'm going to give you some, some insight into some interesting things in the Scriptures. And then we're going to flow in at the end 
And we're really going to begin to deal with spiritual warfare and what God is going to do with women and how it's going to actually catapult us into the days of the Messiah and prep the whole body of Christ when the women are moved into this new place of anointing and leadership and a prophetic voice to be mothers of nations. It's going to usher in the days of the Messiah. See, I came from a religious tradition that kind of held women at bay. And I had to break a lot of tradition and doctrine that had been in my heart that was wrong. And it was a wrestling match for a season in my life for a couple years. You know when it started? When we came here. And there was a woman teaching Torah. I didn't say anything. I was like, that's out of order. That's definitely out of order. And then there was another woman teaching Torah, and I was like, well, we're going to have to straighten this people out, I guess. I just being real. Pastor Scott, you watch it later. I told him. But I just kept quiet and prayed, and the Lord began to deal with me. <laughs> Thank the Lord. So, I, man, from the beginning of our ministry, when, when I got out of the church, and I went and trained in the Messianic community, this was my first step Because Rabbi Joe did a lot of stuff. Help me, Lord. He did some good stuff. And one of the things that he did good was he included his wife in everything. And he taught Jessica and I how to to serve the Lord together as a couple. First place I ever saw that modeled. And we brought that to our leadership team. And we've always empowered the women to pray, to give their voice, to speak discernment, to prophesy. Public teaching, that took me a minute. But there's a season that we're moving into right now where God is preparing the women to have a whole new anointing. He's getting ready to amplify the voice of women And these women are actually going to do exploits that men can't do because it takes male and female to make the image of God on earth. And women are going to bring us into a whole new place of walking in righteousness, tzedakah, and justice, mishpat, which are the foundation of his throne, family. We're going to tie this together prophetically and spiritually and physically Even touching on what pastor brought us last Friday night with the help of the Lord. So who is Sarah anyways? Where's she coming from? Abram and Nahor took wives for themselves. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai. Nahor's wife was Milcah. The daughter of who? Haran was the father of Milcah and Yiscah. Now that's interesting because Haran is the father of Sarah. So why does the scripture not mention Sarah? Because Yiscah is Sarah. From the sages, it is written. Haran was the father of Milcah and Yiscah. The Torah lists Haran's female offspring, and it does not mention Sarah, Sarai. Why doesn't the Torah mention Sarah, who was the daughter of Haran as well? Because Yiscah is Sarah's original name. And that's Jessica. Hallelujah, I got me a Yiscah in English. I got me a princess, hallelujah. So Sarah, her name originally was Yiska. Yiska has the meaning of this, absolutely amazing. To see in the spirit, to have insight, to have prophetic discernment. Yiska could see the future by holy inspiration and people looked at her because she was beautiful. Megillah 14a. The word Yiska actually comes from the word princess. Now, what does Sarai mean? 
What does Sarai mean? Come on, y'all didn't have Sunday school? Interesting. Yiska comes from the word princess. Sarah is named princess. Now, nobody knows why and when or how she changed her name. But it's generally accepted by 99% of scholars, theologians, and sages that this is the case. It can be argued otherwise. So, the Bible doesn't say Yiska is Sarah. Everybody understand? This is what we think. This is my opinion. The Gemara asks, with regard to the prophetesses, female prophets. And you know what female prophet in Hebrew is? Navia. That's my other daughter's name. Who are the seven prophetesses? The Gemara says, Sarah, Miriam, Devorah, Hannah, Avigel, Huda, and Esther. The Gemara offers a textual support. Sarah, as it is written, Haran, the father of Milcah, the father of Yiska, Rabbi Yitzhak, said, Yiska is in fact Sarah. Why is she called Yiska? Listen to this. This is where we get the understanding that if a man and woman are in the right place walking together, the wife is submitted to the husband, the husband is doing what he's supposed to for the Lord, the wife is in proper order, Men are supposed to listen to their wives when they make suggestions. Where do we get it? Right here. Sarah's like, put that woman out of the house. She's messing with our boy. That's my wife, man. What you doing? The Lord says, listen to your wife. Men, we got to get to a new place. Our wives have discernment that we don't. I say this all the time. So this is Yiska. This is the word that means princess. Nesika. Which Yiska is from. This is Sarai which comes, it's the female version of a sar, which is a prince. This and this, these two mean princess. Interesting. Vayomer Elohim el Avraham. And God spoke to Abraham. Sarai... Ishtechalo tikra. You're not going to call her Sarah. Et Sarah, et, et Shma, Sarai, ki Sarah, Shma. So what that says there is, God says to Abraham, you are no longer going to call her Sarai, you're going to call her Sarah. Why? Because she will be the mother of many nations. Amazing. And what did it take just in the Hebrew spelling for the name to change? Come on, tell me. Huh? The letter He was added to her name. The letter He was added to Abram, of Avram. Avram became Avraham. Sarai becomes Sarah. Why? It's a born again experience, family. The He added to the name is what gives you a new name. And you guess what, family? When Yeshua comes back, we all get a new name. That's what the Bible says. I daydream about it like, Lord, it's, it's going to be exactly who you are in the spirit. It's going to be everything that you could be like, that's really me. That's you. That's how I made you to be. Can you just can't wait? I can't, I can't even talk about it. Hallelujah. But the letter hey is hey. Hey. It means breath. It means Behold. The ancient pictograph is this. 
This looks like a basketball, football goal, but it's a man like this with the hands up in the air. So God also said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you're, not long gonna, you're no longer going to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and surely give you a son by her. And I'll bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings and people are going to come from her. And this is the prophetic declaration over the women. God's got some amazing things in store for the women. Vayahihu chayasera. This is Sarah's life. May Yashana again. A hundred years. Ve'esrim shana. Twenty years. Ve'shevashanim. And seven years. Okay, see how I color coded it? Oh, I didn't. I didn't do, put that in there. So it's separated into three categories. And if we take this last part right here, and seven years, and we just remove the vav, we have sheva shanim. We have seven years. So because encoded in the very first part of this word is Messiah, then we take it and we break it apart. We see that the seven years at the end are prophetically speaking to us about the 7,000 time span year of humanity's history. A day with the Lord is a year. A thousand years. Right? Okay. Sarah's life teaches us about the 7,000 year time frame of this present age. Her lifespan was 127 years. Today, a generation is 70 to 80. I think in the 50s or 40s, it was 40. And the advancements in um, diet and medicine and the, and the revolution that came with, um, with infrastructure and, and buildings and all kinds of things, it's advanced. So it doubled. But the average lifespan, a generation, is 70 to 80 years. Does everybody understand? In Matthew 24, Yeshua said, regarding the fig tree, which is Ariel, huh? it's some crazy. Now that still ain't even, oh, all right, I, I write in tongues. I said that the other day. Yeshua said this. So also, when you see all of these things, so you got to read Matthew 24, and you see a whole lot of things. And Yeshua says, when you see these things, this generation will not pass away. I don't know what that means. I mean, I think I might know. We think we know what Yeshua is saying, Right? So we got to be careful when we put words in his mouth. I think this is what he's talking about. But if it's true that a generation that sees things happening with a fig tree will not pass away, let's look at something. When was the fig tree Israel reborn? What happened just before this? So you look at these right here. Now, add 70 years and 80 years to that. Where does it take us? Somebody can do math. I get 17 answers. Raph, what is it? Huh? 28. Now, I heard something else over here. Listen, your math might be crooked. It's okay. He's a banker. I'm going to go with whatever he said. What would you say? 19? 19. 19. <laughs> 20, all right, so let's just say this. I didn't, I didn't plan all this, okay? So I would have had it in here. 2028, okay? So, this tells us we could be like, now, I, I'm not a, I don't set dates. And I'm not, having, I'm not, I'm not Kevin Roberts, okay? <laughs> Kevin. And talk to Kevin about this stuff, okay? Or Craig. Craig's been studying this stuff out, right? That ain't me. I got other stuff I study. But it's interesting for us to know we could be like on the cusp. Oh, my goodness. 
Like, some of us might not go the way of the grave. We may go the way of... We could explode one day and this mortal put on immortality, family. Man. Listen to this. Freedom is a fragile thing and is never more than one. It is not ours by inheritance, must be fought for and defended constantly by each. For it comes only once to a people. Those that have known freedom and lost it will never know it again. This is where we're at. The generation that saw the Holocaust with their eyes, Satan knew they had to die or they would be standing up saying no to the tyranny of the world right now. And those that are alive are saying no to the tyranny right now. But there's only a few Holocaust survivors. But praise the Lord, some of their children and grandchildren are standing up against all of the crazy governmental tyranny that we're dealing with right now. But the reason the mass amount of people have submitted to the masks and the vaccine and all this stuff is because nobody from that generation is alive. Ronald Reagan was prophesying. So we're right at the 70, 80 year mark. And guess what? The Holocaust is coming again. And this time, it's going to be worse than anything the planet has ever seen. But God has a remnant. Amen? And within that remnant are some amazing women that God is going to catapult to a whole new place of serving Him and being His voice in this season. How many of y'all women want to be that? A few of you. Man. Hallelujah. So we have entered the days of the Messiah. The generation that saw Israel reborn will not pass away. Let us learn about what Rabbi Ginsburg prophesied, talking about the four revolutions that will take place in the Torah community before the coming of Mashiach. So Rabbi Ginsburg talked about four different revolutions that would happen within the Torah community before the days of the Messiah. The third and the fourth are where we're at right now. The third revolution that he said would happen is that women would be empowered to not only study Torah, God would give them understanding to, to know the Torah, and they would begin to walk in the Torah, and they would become like Sarah and Deborah in this generation. So women, you've got to study the Bible and you've got to be prayed up for this to happen. Can I challenge you? Get into his word and carve out some time in your day. It ain't just for men anymore. It never was. But I'm going to break that off of y'all's thoughts right now in the name of Yeshua. You're called to a deeper, intimate relationship with the Lord than you, uh, deeper than you've ever had. God's going to call you. You're going to listen. You're going to get on your knees. You're going to carve out some time. He's going to download understanding. He's going to fill you with his Holy Spirit. You're going to prophesy. You're going to do mighty exploits. Come on. I'm telling you what's getting ready to happen. It's not just for men anymore. Amen? See, we're going back pre-Constantine in the days where the women were the first ones that Yeshua ministered to. They were the evangelists. They were teaching Torah. They were prophesying while the men were hiding scared. I'm telling you. So these are the four phases of human action that precede the coming of the Messiah. The last two are happening now. The third is the rise of women to walk like Sarah and Deborah, studying and understanding the Torah. The fourth, listen, women, when you step into this role, guess what the sages say? Now it's time to get rid of the seven Noahide laws and teach all Torah to all nations without conversion. 
Man, you don't understand what that means? I'm telling you, the sages are about to make an edict that has never happened since the Mishnah and Talmud. They're about to actually go against what it says to prepare for the Messiah, which means that they're going to not just teach Gentiles seven laws. They're getting ready to say, y'all Gentiles need it all. And guess what the New Testament calls that? The fullness, calls it Melo Ha Goyim. The fullness of the nations. The fullness of the nations is not the Christian understanding that when that guy in Africa hears the gospel, he's coming. The fullness of the nations is when the nations understand Torah and walk in it. Man, I got downloaded some insight last night while my brother was preaching. That's why there's a song of the Lamb and Moses. That's why the enemy's fighting those that have the testimony of Yeshua and walk in the commandments. There's a specific group of people that are targeted by the enemy. But these people right here, y'all in this room, you're also targeted by the Lord to be doing amazing things for his kingdom. That's why your marriage is under attack. Why do you think women are so beat down and struggling and all this stuff's going on in your marriage? You're being attacked. The enemy's trying to hinder what God wants to do in this generation, family. Some of y'all men got to get it together. And some of y'all women got to submit to your man. It's got to be in order all the way across. Whoo, Hallelujah. The living God is preparing to place his spirit on some women and totally change their destiny. That's a word of the Lord. I was so distracted this week. The Lord gave me the word and then it happened to me. I was in my office. I didn't get any time in the office. These tent meetings, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. It's awesome, but it's wearing us all down, Brother Nathan. (laughs) I just want to go sleep, man. But... I didn't get in my office till Friday. I'm telling you what, I usually take two whole days to prepare these messages. I ain't one of these men that give you little nuggets. It's hours, okay? I come in and want to feed you. I want you to be full till next week, all right? But I was in my office. I could not, I was under such attack. I couldn't even think, man. I was so frustrated. I, my mind was bombarded. And I was like, oh, help me, Lord. I called Sharon Fabry, who overseeing our intercessors. I said, you got to get the team together and pray for me. I can't even think straight. She said, yep, we'll do it. Ten minutes. Something comes in my room. <laughs> my goodness, I start getting all this stuff downloaded to me, man. And praise the Lord. Thank you for praying. You know who you are. I might just ask y'all actually every Friday, just pray whoever's preaching, if it's me or Scott or Tom or Ken or Charles or whoever, just on Fridays at like 10 o'clock, 9 o'clock, if y'all could just set alarm on your phone and pray for this place because it literally affected me in such a positive way. I can't believe we ain't been doing this the whole time. That's what y'all have to do. I feed you. Can you pray for me? Who can pray for us? I want you to agree right now. Don't raise your hand unless you're going to do it because the Lord will see you. I'm serious. We volunteer for stuff and forget. Pray for whoever's preaching in this house every Friday morning, please. For more than five minutes, can you pray for like 15? I ain't never done that. When the women begin... To rise to the place Yahweh has for them in this present age, listen, it is a picture of the body of Messiah coming to his fullness. Why? Because the B'nai Israel, the children of Israel, have always been depicted as the Lord's wife. Think about it. They have to come to a new place because when they come to a new place, they're actually prophetically Moving the body to a new place.
Genesis 18. Why? Why did God choose Abraham and Sarah? Because He knew Him. And He knew that He would command His children, both of them, because they both instructed that they should keep the Derek Yahweh, the way, the path of the Lord, and do what? Think of what Scott told us last week. The foundation of his throne is Mishpat Vazedekah. And in order for the body of Messiah to come to its fullness, God is calling on the women to step into a place of leadership because they're going to be the ones that help us usher in a new level of righteousness and justice. Because a holy woman will look at her man that's also holy and call him out on every single thing that he's doing. Come on, come on, man. If you ain't happen that in your, in your home, you need to pray. Serious. Now listen, in the Middle East, both in the biblical world and today, I, listen, this made me, it's an honor and came, came, listen, when Yeshua came to the culture that he was in, just look at me, just look here. The culture of that day, women had no righteous value. They were the ones that were the lowest on the pole. They were shamed. They did not get justice. They were not treated correctly. They didn't get righteousness or justice. You could divorce your wife according to oral tradition, which is garbage, if she didn't please you intimately or if she burnt the biscuits. They were looked at as property. What did Yeshua do? He came and he elevated their status. He said, I care about you and you are valuable. He broke and shattered every tradition in that culture to elevate women of a place of honor, righteousness, and he served them justice. And he taught his Talmudim, his disciples, to do the same. And then what happened is those men died and women got squished. And then the enemy came to try to pervert what God was going to do and brought us feminism. And God is now saying, Yeshua is saying to you women... I helped you when I came to minister to my body. Now you can help me come back to the planet. Y'all getting it? His twofold ministry with the women and in all his interactions, he brought mishpat v'zedekah. Righteousness and justice. Amazing. Many times, women are more motivated towards justice. Okay? Some in their heart. Right? Now, men also want justice, but the way we get justice is like, I'll knock you out. <laughs> A woman's method of justice is actually from the Lord. <laughs> Okay, we just want to strangle things, break things, hit things. That ain't always right. It takes a man and a woman to bring God's image on earth. Okay? Zakain Nekuva. So, as we move into this third revolution, which I believe in, we will begin to see women walking in their roles as gifted leaders and prophetesses. And these things will bring the body of Messiah to a new place of understanding mishpat, which is what Pastor spoke about last week. Now in the days before the coming of the Messiah, women will help usher in righteousness and justice for His elect. Judges 5 and 6. 
absolutely, this is going to be good stuff right here. The Lord then led me to begin looking at Deborah. Because God is going to raise up Sarah's and Deborah's. Okay? So, you know, the whole book of Judges is they're doing evil. They get taken captive. They pray. God sends a deliver. Right? So... Judges 4. When Ehud was dead, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord again. See, that's all that you listen. It's a pattern that if people don't have leaders and if there's actually not order anywhere, stuff gets out of order. It's, it just doesn't work without order. And the order is there are people that are leading things, and there are people that are not leading things. And that goes at work, school, wherever. So the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sisera. Say that. He dwelt in Harosheth. Hagoyim. Man, you just got to look at all this. When you see words that you can't spell or read, look them up. Because it's actually telling a, a story inside the Hebrew, which I'm not, I can't go in there. The children of Israel then cried out to the Lord, for Jabin had 900 chariots of iron, and for 20 years he had harshly oppressed the children of Israel. Now, Devorah, What's her name mean? Float like a butterfly, sting like a... That's who she was. A prophetess, the wife of Lapidot, was judging Israel at that time. Now, a leader came, goes away. Children of Israel do evil. God sends them into the hands of the enemy. They pray. God sends a deliverer. Deborah would sit as a woman with amazing discernment, and she was a prophet, and she would sit and judge, okay? I want to show you what this actually says in the Hebrew, because the English says, Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidot. How many of y'all's Bibles say that if you brought your Bible? Okay. Okay. Are you telling me I took that out? Oh. Oh, man. When I edited, I took out the cool, the cool slides. Let me just tell you what it says, all right? I wanted to show you in the Hebrew. So, it actually says... Deborah, a woman, a woman of fire. Doesn't say anything about a wife and a husband, okay? It calls her a woman, and then it says she's Ashet Lapidot, a woman of the flames of fire. And that's the thing that God is getting ready to do in some of y'all women. He's getting to me, he's getting ready. If you'll posture your heart right, and if you're married, you have to be submitted to your husband. If you're submitted to your husband, you can have that anointing to a greater degree. Okay? If your husband is in sin and rebellion, God will fill you up. And do amazing things with you, but you won't reach your maximum potential. Okay? But you'll do things while your husband is sleeping on the couch for the Lord. All right? Let 
So Deborah is raised up. And then it says this. So Barak comes. And the Lord is saying that, that Barak is called to go take the troops. The word of the Lord comes to Deborah, and she's like, we got to go, and we got to fight this army. And Barak is scared. He doesn't want to go without the judge and the prophet. And he's like, listen, will you just please go with us? Please, I need your help. And she said, yeah, I'll go with you. Nevertheless, there will be no glory for you in this journey you are taking for the Lord. God will turn over Sesra to the hand of a woman. So you know the story of the battle that wages and the victory that comes and all 900 chariots are destroyed. Only one person escapes and his name is Sisera. And he runs to a tent of a lady whose name is Yael. Yael means to ascend. It's not Yael, it has an I in. So it's not Yahweh is God, it's Yael meaning to ascend. This woman was ascending to her position. Catch it. This woman was in the process of ascending and meeting her destiny that day. Just like Ken said, she was just going about her day, her regular day in the tent working. But she must have been in an awesome place with the Lord because she was ascending. She was praying and she, she knew she had destiny. And Cesara comes in. Hey. Hide me. Let me if anybody comes, you don't even know where I'm at. Shoo, goes back. Okay. So she's like, I'm, all right, listen. Just lay down right here. Nighty night. Just lay right here. No, the Spirit of the Lord's on this woman. Have some hot milk. Just go to sleep. I won't tell. He's sleeping. Just, can you imagine this? <laughs> I tried to imagine it. Like this morning, I got up early. I was in the office and I was like, I don't know if I could do that. That's why God's got to get some women. Y'all women, man. You mess with a mama bear, you're, you're getting clawed. Your face is done. You're going to be a skull when it's over. But she kills him. And the word of the Lord that was spoken by the prophetess, Deborah, came to pass. Now, I don't know how this would have played out if he would have been like, I'm nervous, but I'll do it. But after the victory, this is the cool part, family. Listen to this. After the victory, they sing a song. Isn't it cool? There's this whole thing of the songs that we're learning. I don't understand it, but there's always these songs that are proclaiming victory. What about our worship team that can sing and play for hours? Hallelujah. Thank you, guys. We are blessed. When you sing that hard for that long, it wears you out. When you play an instrument for that long and that hard, it wears you out. Our worship team needs your prayers too. Thank you, Lord. Please pray for the worship team. They need your prayers. So they sing this amazing song. I'm only going to read a little bit of it. But listen to this. I didn't even know this was in the Bible, what I'm about to share with y'all. I mean, you know how you read stuff and it just, 
until the Lord highlights it, you're like, is that really in there? Then Deborah and Barak, the son of Ani Oam, sang on that day a song saying, listen to this. This is a pattern. This actually right now, this first part is giving us a pattern for victory, and we're going to come back to it at the end. So listen to the pattern for victory. When the leaders, oh, I got this one actually. I'll retranslate it. It's a little bit better version. Okay, let me go here. All right, this is my version. Then Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam, sang on that day, saying, When the princes are the leaders in Israel, take the lead, which means the, if the leaders are doing what David did when the kings go to war and they're laying back and chilling and sleeping and get looking at women, this won't happen. But when the leaders lead, number one, and when the people willingly offer themselves, what that actually means is when the people are submitted to the leaders and are volunteering as much as they can, volunteering as much as they can. Yes. <laughs> praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Why? Why praise the Lord? Because when they sent to gather together and get a war plan, they got the leaders and the people, and they said, we got to go to war. And the leaders were in position, and the people said, we're with you. And they charged ahead into victory. Let's keep reading. Let's see if I have this. Okay. Hear, O kings, give ear, O princes, I... Even I will sing to the Lord. Amen? I'll sing praises to the Lord God of Israel. Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the field of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens poured. The clouds poured water. Are y'all catching like Deuteronomy kind of stuff in here? The mountains gushed before the Lord. This is Sinai before the Lord God of Israel. In the days of Shamgar, son of Anat, in the days of Yael, the highways were deserted, and the travelers walked along the byways. Village life ceased. It ceased in all of Israel until I, Deborah, arose. Arose a mother in Israel, family. Rise up, mothers of Israel. I call the mothers of Israel to rise up and take your place. Birth children for the kingdom. Walk in your destiny. Prophesy. Seek the Lord while there's daylight. I speak an amplification over your voice. I speak an anointing in your life in the mighty name of Yeshua. Try not to talk in tongues into the mic as much as I used to. <laughs> they chose new gods. There was war in the gates. Not a shield or spear was seen among 40,000 in Israel. What in the world does that mean? I don't know, but the Bible always declares that when Israel went to war... Judah went forth praising, man. And the mountains and the hills will break forth before you. My heart is with the rulers of Israel who offered themselves willingly with the people. Bless the Lord. She repeats it again. Because the people were leading, the, I mean, because the leaders were leading, the people saw that there was 
I can trust the leaders right now. And they got in order. Deborah says, that's what brought the victory. That's why God's from time to time, listen, people might come here and you might see them for a year or two or a month. But sometimes God has to prune in order for growth to happen. Just don't get caught up in any nonsense talk or you get pruned also. Okay? I'm going to just tell you, we are not perfect. I mess up all the time. And my mess ups are in front of all these people. And, I, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm, challenged, I'm, I'm a challenging man to be around. So give me lots of grace. And don't be offended with me. And if I, inten- if I uh, unintentionally, if you get offended, just come talk to me, man. Please. I never want to hurt anybody. But I'm plowing ahead, and we got a group of leaders that are in place, and we got a bunch of people that are coming. So if you want to stay on the train, stay on the train. If you want to bounce out, it's all good. Amen? Amen. I want you all with us. We don't want to lose anybody. But if people won't submit, God will take them out because it's poison to the camp. That's hard, but it's true. We're talking about the pattern for victory. It does not say when the leaders are in place and the people are rebellious and talking and gossip because somebody didn't do this and whatever it is. It is not what it says. We're getting a pattern for victory. And the song continues to go, but then it gets to this part. This is absolutely amazing. Here's how their victory came. I don't know what happened in the war, right? But this is how the victory came. The kings came and fought. They fought the kings in a place in a city called Tanakh. What is Tanakh? If you look it in the Hebrew, I like I knew what it meant immediately, but I was like, I need to check. It says uncertain word. Well, Tanakh is Torah, T, Nevaim, N, Ketavim, K. Tanakh is the Old Testament. And listen, there's a whole teaching because it's by the waters of Megiddo. Dig into that and find out some cool stuff. But this is where the battle was in a place called the Old Testament. Come on. Now listen. Listen. They fought from heaven. Who? The stars in their courses. The stars in their courses fought from heaven against Sisera? God has said in his word, Behold, I make my servants flames of fire and my malachim wind. We don't understand in this present age right now what it's like to have angelic help. But may the word of the Lord come to pass in this generation that we begin to understand what it means when we're in order and when the people submit, we can get help from the stars, family. I'm telling you what, we're getting ready to move in signs and wonders and miracles. We're getting ready to tap into a whole new level of the spirit where Malachim are going to be helping us. I'm telling I'm so excited. I am so excited. I want to see this stuff happen, man. So then I'm looking, I'm like, this is blowing me away. Actually, Prophet Kevin, our friend, said, I was talking to him yesterday, and he he said, um, and I've been saying this for like a couple of years, like God's getting ready to do something with the women. God's getting ready to do. He said, hey, you should go read that story. When the women were leading and everybody got into order, he said the stars helped. And I was like, man, that ain't even in the Bible. <laughs> he said, it's there. I said, that ain't in there, brother. <laughs> ain't not. I have read that story. Okay. I totally forgot. This was a couple of days ago. I'm in my office studying. I'm led to go there. Then I'm reading this, and I was like, oh, my goodness, it's here. (laughs) So then I'm like, this is amazing. So I'm studying, and there's a cross-reference to Joshua 10. 
Did you know what happened in Joshua 10? Same thing. Check this out. Oh, I want to read it in Hebrew. Min Shemaim, from heaven. Nil Chamu, they fought. Min Shemaim, Nil Chamu, they fought. From heaven, they fought. Who? Hakol Kavim, the stars. Mimes Lotam. Nilchama im sesra. From heaven the stars came. Mim sil otam. In their courses, nilchamu, they fought im sisra with sesra. That's amazing. Because Chochavim is stars, but we know what stars actually means. We know what stars mean, right? What does the Bible say in the book of the Revelation? The dragon took what? Some stars and brought them. Let me tell you what's going on. Because of the rebellion that happened before humanity was created... Because of that rebellion, some of those stars who were like priests in the kingdom before had to be taken out of their place. And that's what we're actually in training right now. I got a teaching called Replacing the Stars. You should go check it out. We are being trained to be kings and priests, and we are going to replace those rebellious stars as ambassadors for God throughout all eternity. Joshua 10. Listen, this is amazing. There's a battle going on, and listen to what it says. The Lord threw them into confusion before Israel. So Joshua and the Israelites defeated them completely at Gibeon. Israel pursued them along the road going up to Beit Horon and cut them down all the way to Azekah and Makadeah as they fled before Israel on the road down to Beit Horon and Azekah. Listen, the Lord hurled large hailstones on them. The sages say that the captain of the Lord of hosts said to the Chochavim, throw some hell down there and kill them. It's actually a biblical pattern that when the leaders lead and the people submit, the stars from their courses will get involved in our daily life and bring victory to the saints. Isn't that amazing? So these scriptures are teaching us when these things line up. Listen, women... In a new anointing. Now listen, if you're not submitted to your man, you are in rebellion. If your husband asks you to do something, it doesn't matter. If your husband says, will you do this? Women are called to actually submit to their husbands. Number one. But it's hard for a woman to submit to a drug addict, porn addict, video game play and lazy man. And sometimes I want to tell women, like, you don't have to, but I can't do that. So, men, you got to get your act together. You got to wake up, men. You got to put on the full armor of God and stand against the wiles of the enemy because Satan has put a plan in place to have the angels affect you in a bad way so that you can affect the kingdom in a good way, knowing that if you're in line, the stars will help you. Everything rises and falls on the men. Stop blaming your wife. I'm tired of hearing my wife this and that. If you had a business and everything fell apart, it's not your employee's fault. You aren't managing it right. Men, step up. Lead your families. Get your act together. I'm tired of men saying they can't get off of porn and they can't do... Yes, you can! You just ain't fall. You're lazy. I'm going to make some people mad. 
I'm tired. I want men to stand up and sell out and fast and pray until you got the anointing. For real. Smile. So when the women move into this anointing, because if you're married, the first thing, first thing, you got to submit to your husband. You submit to your husband, then you can be one of these vessels. You can be an ashit lapidote, a woman of the fiery flames, okay? If you're single, just submit to Yahweh. Might be easier for y'all. I tell my wife all the time, I know it's hard being married to me. Y'all don't know what it's like at my house. I'm hard to deal with, man. It's a, and my wife is submitted. That's why God's, she's pulling me forward. She's like in an amazing place with the Lord. She's better than she's ever been with the Lord. She has not lost traction. When I lost traction, she said, get up, you're being lazy. And so listen, when, my, when I like paraphrase my wife, she, sometimes she says it, but it's not as like hard as I do sometimes, but sometimes she is, but... Because her heart is right, and I know she's submitted, and because she's right all the time, I'm learning to just do what she says. You think that's wrong. I'm telling you what, I lead my home. Don't you get it twisted. All right? If I know God's will, there ain't nothing anybody can say. But when I don't, I listen to my wife. That's what we should do, guys. Listen, that's actually what you need to do. So I'm not teaching women are over men. Don't get that twisted. Okay? So this is, the, this is the pattern. When the women are in the new anointing and the leaders are in the right place leading and the people are submitted, we can expect help from heaven. Hallelujah? Hallelujah. So these, now, that's part, now I'm going to just end with something absolutely amazing, a little bit off the subject. Okay? Everybody cool? So, the four phases that precede the coming of the Messiah. I'm not going to talk about the first two. If you want to know what they are, you can come talk to me. The third and fourth revolution are this. The rise of women. And the fourth, when that happens, the next thing that's getting ready to happen is the rabbis of Israel are going to make an edict to get rid of the... Now, this is going to cause a split in the community of the Orthodox. But they're going to get an edict. They're going to make it. And one of the top rabbis in the land of Israel is the one that's bringing all this to pass. It's the one that we went there to meet and missed the appointment. Rabbi Ginsburg. But we're reestablishing that meeting. Pray for us. Because I'm trying to reach out. Now, we may never get back to Israel, but he comes to the States. So we're trying to pray through all that stuff. Amen. He knows who we are. He knows where we are. And he was so excited that we had a group of pastors and leaders that were going to come to Israel and that we're teaching the Torah to the nations to bring them together with the Jewish people. They know what the fullness of the Gentiles means. They're waiting on us. So I'm just going to read some of the stuff from what he's written. And then we're going to pray. Hope this encourages you. Okay? Rabbi Ginsburg acknowledged... It, it. <laughs> Just bear with me. I don't... It is... What is... I don't even know what I'm doing. That's supposed to be... Yeah, it is right. Thank goodness. Just... This rabbi acknowledges... It's the task of the Jewish people to dece... That... <laughs> Teach and disseminate the Torah of the Noahides to all mankind. So in order for a person to just be like a good person, they have to do the seven B'nai Noah laws, right? If you don't know what that is, you can look at it later. The Torah of the Noahides is a reference to the Sheva Mitzvot B'nai Noah, the seven laws which according to the Talmud were given by God to Noah and intended for all humanity. In practice, these Noahide laws are the most fundamental human obligations. But keeping the seven Noahide mitzvot does not suffice. Can somebody say amen? amen? This level of Torah study alone cannot fully realize the idea of takun alam. If you don't know what that means, that means the fixing of everything in the universe. 
In other words, the teaching of the seven Noahide laws to non-Jews is no longer good enough according to some of the sages in Israel. We already knew that. They're just now getting it. We've been saying it for a minute. Instead, Rabbi Ginsburg strongly advocates for much more Torah study. This is called the fourth revolution family among non-Jews. The nations of the world can only recognize the Torah as the source of all the sparks of truth that their religions contain if they're exposed to the, the entire Torah in all of its glory. They must study Torah in a way that reveals its depth. The stuff we teach, that's got to go to the church, family. They got to get off the milk, and they got to get into some deep stuff. They must study Torah in a way that reveals its depth and its profound relevance to their own lives. Can somebody say amen? Amen. What does it mean practically? Rabbi Ginsburg charges the Jewish people with a crucial mission. We are being called upon to begin offering Torah to the non-Jews without limiting them to studying only the seven laws. Can somebody say amen? If you don't know what that means, that's a big deal. The intention in teaching Torah to non-Jews, the intention in teaching Torah to non-Jews, they don't want them to be forced into conversion. Which is what it's always about. Like, I got Orthodox friends. I talk to them. And, they, you know, I'm, I'm telling them they need the Messiah. And they say, well, you need to convert. And I'm like, I already converted. And so we wrestle back and forth. But the days are soon coming when women step into their role that the Torah is going to go to the nations without limits. Not from us, which we're doing it now in a small group, but from the actual people from Judah, which is where the scepter resides. Amen.